Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is the real state of real estate for January 27, 2022. This is the Queen's Chamber of Commerce and the Real Estate Committee who is hosting this. Um, so thanks again for coming. My name is Michael Wang. I am the co-chair of the Real Estate Committee here, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. We did this last year. And the premise was that the pandemic was affecting every segment of business in America, uh, but the economy was reopening and we explored what that meant and what it would look like. And it seems that we are still uh, in that phase in a way. And here we are again, coming out of it. Uh, but is it better to say that we're coming out of it or are we moving forward into this quote unquote new normal. Uh, our experts here will do their best to address the question today. And we have a great panel lined up. So there'll be Q&A after. Feel free to type in your questions in the chat at any time. And I will turn it over to the panelists to introduce, introduce themselves. Stephen, do you want to go? Sure. Thanks, Michael. Glad to be here. Uh, and look forward to having another discussion uh, with Kevin White and, uh, and you here for the Queen's Chamber. Uh, so as an introduction, my name is Stephen Pruce. I am vice chairman of RIPCO uh, for their investment sales division. I head up the capital markets and have a specialization in the Queen's marketplace uh, across all asset classes. I'll jump in. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Kevin White, looking forward to speaking with everybody today. I um, am on the CoStar and LoopNet Digital Marketing Information uh, Network. We basically focus my expertise and where I focus are the five boroughs from a holistic approach down to organically. So we're kind of looking forward to getting back into this for maybe the fourth time with you guys uh, and kind of going through where we are, which is looking at a crystal ball these days. Awesome. And uh, again, I'm your moderator. I'm the CEO of Project Queens, where we specialize in commercial leasing in Queens and the surrounding areas. So let's begin. Uh, we're going to start off with a macro overview. And just in general, uh, it's now the end of January, brand new year, 2022. A lot of people were very excited around the holidays to say 2022 is going to be an amazing year. At least that's what I heard from like everybody so where do you see things Stephen? where do you see things going this year what's your outlook all uh, right so we're definitely moving forward in a more favorable fashion uh last year we made a lot of strides you know coming out of uh the initial shock of the pandemic uh it was fluid in some cases and it wasn't fluid in, in other cases uh, a lot of it is, is asset driven uh and asset class driven um, we're seeing some real green shoots uh, in industrial, uh, in multifamily, and specifically in free market multifamily, and even more specifically in tax class protected um, small cap multifamily, which you know we can go into. Uh, but overall, um, we are are really being driven by the amount of accessible capital right now, both on the debt and the equity sides. In my 20 years. I've never seen such availability of that capital. Uh, and there really isn't enough quality product and available product for all that capital to find a home. So that's the interesting dynamic we're in right now um, where you know, the people that are out there looking for transactions, uh, they are funded, uh, they are qualified going through the, the pandemic, it went through a natural vetting process where a lot of the syndicators, uh, a lot of the groups that we're looking to raise capital, uh, maybe we're not with strong balance sheets or uh, histories, you know, those those kind of faded into the background where we're seeing more qualified buyers and capital groups in the marketplace today. So a lot of it is being driven by that access to capital. And then it flows through to, you know, asset classes um, and, and specific properties. But overall, uh, it's a quality driven market. Uh, people have that capital. Uh, they want to hedge any downturn of volatility in an uncertain marketplace by putting that capital to use in the better product, uh, better areas, Maine in Maine, 
uh, better product. Uh, they want to have more uh, of a storyline, even if it's a little less value add. So that's what we've been dealing with, um, you know, over the last year or so. Uh, we've had an active year last year. My team and I sold about a billion dollars worth of product. We transacted on, on nearly a billion dollars worth of product last year. Um, a lot of it was bucketed into certain types of assets, again, which we'll go through on the panel here. Uh, but we're, we're along with that access of capital, the other, the other real uh, focal point um, and motivation point is interest rates. So uh, just to touch on that real quickly, um, we have seen historically low rates for the last few years. Um, we've always been talking about, uh, you know, a call to action that those rates will eventually raise and it seemed like, uh, you know, that was more so talk as, it, as they stayed low, they continued to go lower. But I think what you're seeing right now, it's pretty clear, uh, especially what we've heard from the Fed over the last few weeks is that rates are going up. It's happening. It's a real thing. Uh, and this is really the motivational point for people that are uh, sitting on capital access to, uh, to debt. Um, it, it's really a call to action for them to put that capital and that access to debt to use. So we're seeing a real run on product, uh, again, quality product uh, over the last few weeks as we've seen that indication that uh, it, these rates will increase over the year. Um, so with the access of capital, uh, and then now with the interest uh, interest rates rising and, and the clear path that they are, will be rising over the next year, those two together are going to fuse and really push volume and activity upwards, in my opinion. So there's going to be a race to to use the money. Correct, correct. Because you know even if they go up a quarter or a half a point. Um, you know, that's going to have a real change, you know, both on the selling and the buying side. Sellers who are selling, you know, cap rate based properties and we're still getting, you know, four to five caps on, on the best product and five to six uh, caps on the secondary product. You know, and you, if the rates do go up, you know, 25 or 50 basis points on a, a typical product, you know, that we sell, which is, you know, 10 to 20 million dollars in the outer boroughs and the mid markets. You know, you're talking about a, a seven-figure change on what they're willing to to uh, uh, to pay for that product. So that's going to be a change on the seller side. On the buyer side, um, you know, the interest rates are going to affect what they can essentially pay, um, and they'd rather lock into um, you know a 15-year, three percent uh, interest rate uh, rather than a year from now, where you know maybe a five-year at four percent. So it's going to affect them on what they can pay. Um, which may, may not make them competitive uh, against maybe institutional groups, which are paying all cash. So there's an interesting dynamic that's really fueling a lot of people saying now is the time to transact. And to your earlier point where there's this kind of flight to quality, that seems to be more of a kind of cautious approach. So would you say that, I mean, how do you feel about people in a position to acquire new assets or spend the money that they're able to get. And is that going to be, do you think that's going to be focused into these quality assets or do you think it's going to now spill over into like a wider market? A great point. Uh, I, I would say it's going to spill over because again, there's not enough inventory to fill that capital. Um, and I, I think people are also getting their footing, right? So over the last you know two years, 18 months, um, every month that goes by, the uncertainty calms down a bit, um, either whether it's in mindset or just a stabilization, um, not seeing flux in the marketplace. Uh, so overall, people were hedging the uncertainty going directly for that quality asset. But again, there's not a lot out there. There's not enough inventory. Uh, and the longer we uh, separate ourselves from the uncertainty of the uh, the initial period of the pandemic, the more, more comfortable these investors and groups are going to be able to um, go ahead and take a little bit more risk uh, on, on their, their outlook. So I would assume uh, that quality assets are still going to um, get premium pricing, um, but out of necessity uh, and out of comfortability, we're going to see that spill over into the secondary and tertiary markets. Kevin, what are you seeing in the data in 2021 now that it's concluded? And do you see any trends going into 2022 in, as a, in general right now? 
so going to kind of Steven's point, um, sales volume has gone up like quarter over quarter, like we're seeing that trend. And I think a lot of it is because like recovery has been underway for a while. Like, I mean, there might've been a couple of false starts where we were like, Hey, we're over the initial phase. And then there was Delta. And now we're in kind of Omicron, like where we saw that, but through that, I think a lot of folks going to the point Stephen made about uncertainty, we're kind of getting a better sense of what new normal is, where we're going through that. So a lot of the buyers or even tenants that really were concerned a little bit about what the market might look like are kind of getting their, their feet under the ground and saying, okay, this is where we're going. This is what's going to work. This is what's not going to work. So when you look at the actual data points, when we look at, let's say, Q4 2020 and Q4 2021, there was not significant change. Like we, we kind of like for the office market, for instance, for Queens, like vacancy hasn't dynamically shift plus or minus a lot of, a lot of ways, but you know, that's, you really, and we can get into it a little bit more. That's market by market specific. There's different stories to tell in different areas, but you're seeing a lot of things kind of hitting a status quo where we're seeing things coming out. So you have a lot of folks that are feeling okay to put money back into the market. And now we're seeing like, Hey, interest rates are changing. It's time to get in. And you see quarter by quarter by quarter, the sales volume going up, even coming into just January, we're outpacing you know, our, our three month average of sales volume already in terms of number of transactions coming in. And then you also have larger players coming into the market too, in different asset classes, more institutional folks, especially on the industrial side, betting on Queens. Again, you have Pro Lodges coming in and making a splash. You have a lot of these other guys making a splash because they believe in the Queens market and one of the things very strong about Queens is always the demographics and community of people that live here. Like Queens supports its own economy in a lot of ways. Like you have people that come in and out and move different ways, but Queens has this dense population. They have more people coming in. You have like, you know, migration coming in from international communities now back into the market. So people are starting to feel more comfortable and starting to take a breath. It, it seems like from the data where we're stabilizing and things are not where they were, you know, call it two or three years ago, but we were talking kind of, I think about that deep V or the deep U curve, everybody kind of thought it would be. It's getting there. It's not quite as sharp and dramatic, but we're trending upwards where it may take us, call it two or three years to get back where we were, but things are moving in the right direction. It's just not as fast as we thought because we had a couple of stop starts. So how, how much are we behind currently from 2018 and 2019 transaction levels? So it, it depends, right? So like we can kind of take it group by group. There's different things. Like for some of the office assets, it's slower, right? There's a 2019 for industrial was the peak boom year. Everybody came in, they threw money in the pool and that's where they were going. 2020, 21, still ahead, but not kind of that boom. On the office side, like between um, 2019, 2020, it's moving up. Like there's more transactions going, not a lot of the level high institutional stuff happened last year, aside from that really big Kaufman Studios deal. That was kind of the big splash in the market for last year. Um, we're still behind depending like where you look at it, decent percents across the board. Um, we're not quite at our sales peak. It, it, it depends like sales pricing are getting more reasonable. They at the difference between what folks were asking for and what stuff was closing. I think last year was like in 15% difference. Now we're seeing less than eight. So I think we're starting to get to more of a developed market. So we're not quite there, like we're recovering, but I think a lot of it might be two or three years out. So we really stabilize and get back where we are, but we're marching in the right direction. I, for us, pretty much most asset classes, either they've stabilized to the new normal and people understand their threshold of risk because that's kind of flatlining in terms of what we're seeing. Um, so I think they're a lot more comfortable. And I think, I think hopefully with the interest rate hikes coming, we'll see a lot more folks jumping in the pool and that'll kickstart a lot more for us too. Like they're going to jump in the pool quicker than they maybe would have instead of dipping their toes in it. So I think this is a good segue to go into the actual asset classes. Now that we have this uh, larger overview, what uh, last year and, and throughout this pandemic and even before it was industrial is super hot and residential was surprisingly good, if, if, that, if that's the right word. Office was doing you know, not so good at all. And uh, retail was, uh, I'm not sure what the consensus was, but my, my idea was retail was doing generally pretty good. 
and that flight to quality was there. Um, how I see it moving forward is kind of that has even become more so where um, people are on both sides of the spectrum are more cautious and looking to get into more stable and more high quality positions. Um, what is the best performing uh, asset class to you, Stephen, now and the worst performing ones and just your uh, breakdown of the, of the segments? So if, if industrial is uh, on fire, as you said last year, it's meteoric now, as far as we can see it. We're, we're continuing to uh, outpace what we sold the quarter before or the year before. Um, overall, and I'm sure Kevin has the exact statistics, but we're seeing uh, the industrial rental rates now push towards $30 a foot, uh, where you're marking about 27, 28 on average. Uh, which is uh, extremely high. I mean, these are retail rents that you're getting for industrial type of product. Um, land uh, for industrial, M-zoned land. I mean, the last several deals that we've done with acreage, uh, we were pushing eight to 10 million an acre, and now we're pushing 12 to $15 million an acre and in some circumstances higher uh, in, in some of the better parts uh, of Queens. Uh, so industrial overall is, is certainly the asset class leader uh, and specifically the Queens as far as I can see. Um, construction is also uh, you know, picking up. We, uh, by our count, there's over about 2 million square feet uh, of industrial development going on in the borough, um, you know, which is substantial. Uh, so that's really leading the way. Um, secondarily, you know, we see um, or what we've seen, I guess, over the last several months was a run on development sites. So uh, I'm sure you're familiar that 421A is expiring or set to expire uh, in June of this year, um, which means that in order to qualify for this program, that you have to have uh, plans in place and foundations in place by the June deadline, um, which makes it tricky for somebody to buy, uh, very risky, uh, because of the entitlement risk, if you're buying raw land or a development site that's unentitled without plans, uh, because the planning process in New York City, you know, could take anywhere from six months to 18 months, uh, depending on what you're looking to build and the complexity of it. Uh, so what we've seen is a lot of people who still want to build, they still have the capital and wherewithal to get, uh, you know, funding or have access to capital to, to move these developments through, but they're looking for entitled sites. So we've seen a phenomenon uh, over the last several months where these sites that have approved plans or entitlements are getting huge premiums. Uh, over the past 20 years, a piece of raw land, a development site, let's say, um, compared to something with uh, approvals in place or plans in place, uh, we've typically seen about a 5 to 10 percent premium because of those entitlements, somebody stepping into uh, the previous developer shoes who has put some value to the site. Um, because of this expiration and developers not willing to take um, this entitlement risk and miss uh, the, the potential 421A expiration, uh, the, the marketplace was paying a huge premium. These premiums went from 10 to 30 percent for approved plans. So uh, double to tripled in some circumstances. Um, so we have put a lot of development product in contract that has been entitled for larger prices um, than we've seen even before uh, the pandemic in some circumstances, just because of those entitlements and getting that 421A certainty or, or mitigating the risk of taking on uh, unentitled product. That is now slowing down just because even if you do have entitlements to be able to get demo permits, if there is a property, uh, or building on the property and be able to get the foundation in the ground by June is, is, is a big risk. So we're seeing a, a, a real slowdown and a pause on many of these residential development sites, which is by far the majority uh, in Queens. There's only a certain faction, a small faction of, of condo development sites in certain areas. So we're seeing that, that, that trend shift away from residential development um, now and looking for a home for that capital, which a lot of it is now flowing out of development and into places like industrial. And then uh, the, the third category that I want to touch on was multifamily. So we're seeing a lot of people now uh, want to 
place a pause on development and, and go to existing bricks. Um, and what we're seeing with multifamily is that Queens uh, has um, fared the best as far as vacancy rates and occupancy rates uh, throughout um, the boroughs. Uh, through, uh, during the pandemic, we've seen very, very uh, little change in those vacancy rates, uh, especially for existing type of product um, and, and the non-luxury product, you know, outside of maybe the waterfront in, in Long Island City, where we saw a little bit more vacancy. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people look at that type of product now. Um, cap rates have compressed uh, over the past 18 months. We're seeing for free market uh residential purchases that cap rates can dip all the way down to the low fours um you know especially if they're tax class protected uh 2a and 2b um so those are are very much in demand and we're seeing institutional capital come after that as well that's been historically uh just because of that uh, tax class protection uh and what that usually um you know boxes into you know small cap uh, developments. When I say small cap, those those types of residential uh, properties that are under 10 million, which typically were generational buyers, local buyers, community buyers, uh, and now we're seeing institutions, large institutions, now pull their capital and go after this very very um, uh, excessively and aggressively, which has skyrocketed some of the numbers. Uh, we're seeing a little bit more in Brooklyn uh, just because of the availability of that product, but in Queens and certain areas like Sunnyside, Long Island City, Astoria, uh, some of the more brownstone type of areas, uh, we're seeing close to five, six, seven hundred thousand a unit or, or per square foot. Um, and cap rates now drive below a five cap. Uh, and then the, the last piece of that is uh, the newer, newer construction uh, with the 421A abatement in place uh, on the existing product. Um, we're seeing also um, a real uh, need for that. And that goes back to the, um, the interest rate discussion where you know, people can get really attractive financing, which allows them to pay a five cap or four and a half cap if they're getting two and a half to 3% money. Uh, so now that, that uh, those interest rates are rising for that type of product, we're seeing a lot of people now try to put that to use why they can lock in those two to three percent uh, interest rates. OK, and does that have to do also with anything about the existing 421A expi expiring? Or is this just like a psychological thing? Uh, it, I mean, in some circumstances, I mean, you, you have that money that was set aside for development of that product where you know, they're not going to put that money to use until we have clarity uh, on the new 421A, which will we'll have to find a new home for that capital. And, and a lot of it is going into existing built. So I guess that's the dynamic where you'll see um, some, some further push uh, because of the, um, the expiration of the 421A. And when when you see the activity in these sectors, so we went over just now industrial um, and new developments and uh, some newly built residential and like mixed use residential things, uh, properties. Is this main and main stuff or is this also kind of across the board uh, with the activity? Uh, it depends on the pricing level and you know who's looking for it. Um, but there, it's so scarce for that product and there's such a, a demand. I mean, I, I guess making the point that you made before as far as a spillover, you know, everyone would like to look at Long Island City and buy a five and a half cap new construction, but you know, there's not a lot of that to choose from and available and the sellers are not usually willing to, to sell, um, you know, if, if they have good debt in place and, and, um, and occupancies up. So, you know, we're, we're having people look much deeper into Queens, into, into Woodside and Elmhurst and Regal Park and even some parts of Jamaica. Um, so I, I think that those specific asset classes is more broad uh, than some of the other. Got it. Um, so we could go into a couple of different things here. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about how much the institutional investors have come in, but I'm also thinking about because, you know, I do leasing primarily in these asset classes and Kevin can uh, give us some insight on this, you know, what is the vacancy looking like? What are the absorption rates looking like um, from coming out of 2020 and 2021 and as compared to 
you know, 2019 and, and before, where exactly are we at in terms of occupancy, occupancy and rates for, and let's just stick with the, with the uh, segments that we have, that we're talking about right now for, let's say industrial and uh, I don't know if you have the resi stuff up there, but, you know, let's just start with that. So kind of going to Stephen's point of like the hottest asset classes, the investment and the leasing kind of falls hand in hand. Like industrial leasing is still incredibly hot rent growth, like going kind of across the board upwards of 5% for a lot of these folks, you know, like it's just the time and the right place to be. Um, you have like South Queens where you have probably the biggest construction nearly over a decade occurring in that marketplace. And they're still, even with that, seeing, um, positive absorption rates from a previous negative 60,000 square foot absorption rate last year to over 100,000 square foot of positive industrial space, even with more spaces coming on the market. So as they build it or as they spec build it in South Queens, um, kind of like logistic areas like they around the airports, it's getting eaten up. And a lot of these owners are taking shorter leases because they're seeing the writing on the wall and they're saying, hey, if we if we do a three or two year deal, at this rate, we're going to get three or four, four percent that. So they're comfortable with that. It's just a hot market across the board, even like central Queens with like when Nasbeth, where Prologis is betting in that market. Now you have a lot of markets where they typically had negative absorption, but between the demolitions and different things going on, it's still a really hot market. So industrial is still chugging along. Rents are still chugging along above historical averages. There's a ton of stuff coming on but it seems like the appetite's kind of going along with it. So it's just kind of staying hot. And then retail kind of stabilized, right? Because when we first started retail, there was like this wide scale panic. You had a lot of major retailers going bankrupt. A lot of those folks were, we lost some like Neiman Marcus of the world, things like that. Those guys are gone. New folks are coming in and we're kind of seeing like these new companies taking space and who they're going to be and what the new kind of voice of retail looks like. When you look at retail activity 2020, retail activity 2021, a lot of that's stabilized now, right? So when you look at the vacancy rate in retail last year, uh, Q4, it was 3.7% across the borough, right? It's 3.4 now. So it came down a little bit, much down from where it was, but we're starting to kind of keep that normal trend now. When you look at like Northeast Queens, like the Flushing area, um, Vacancy is still ticked upward, but that's because you have large projects coming on. You have Tangram coming on. You have all these, you know, mixed use projects coming on that are kind of adding to the vacancy, but the market demands there. Leasing activity is up. A lot of the leases are smaller in, in that area. They're not the bigger box guys like old Navy and folks have come in, but they're mostly the traditional Queens based businesses around 3000 square feet of retail that are kind of eating up those. And you probably see a lot of those on main street or, the major throughways of Queens where people want to be, those are still getting kind of eaten up pretty quickly in LIC, same kind of thing. It, it, retail vacancies are tighter. Um, rents are up a little bit, 1.6% in the past 12 months in LIC for retail spaces. A lot of that probably is, you know, that it's a strong market where people live. People pulled out of the city a little bit. They came to LIC, not the growth we were hoping for, but still there. Um, so retail's chugging along. Office is kind of the one where people are still trying to feel out, right? So recovery is underway for sure. We are five, I think it's five quarter over quarter retail um, office lease activity kind of increasing. So it's going up, right? Um, vacancy hasn't changed dramatically. We're around roughly 10% borough wide, um, but we kind of have to do look at that area by area because it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of wave through and I'll kind of go through in a second. Sublet space is up but a lot of it is coming off. So we had a lot of folks that were throwing their office on the market saying office is dead. We're never going back. There are a lot of folks that are rethinking that clearly and that are taking their sublet space off the market. So we see that coming down. You have a lot of big, um, and I think this is positive for, for New York as a whole, a lot of big tech companies that are virtual by nature, right? Microsoft, Facebook, TikTok, betting on New York City and seeing value in office space, buying wholesale and really taking strong leasing. So that's a good sign. And I think should alleviate a lot of people's, you know, back to office in New York nationwide is a little bit behind the curve in terms of how many people are back to office. We trail a decent amount of the major markets, but I think that's a lot to depend on where the waves hit us of a lot of different things. We're a little bit ahead. So we'll probably see that shifting. But if you look at like Northwest Queens, the LIC market, a lot of the leasing done there lately has been smaller in size, right? You had the 
um, what was it, the Fauci building did like a 60,000 square foot lease with a GSA tenant. That was a pretty big splash in the market for the last quarter. But most of the leases were call it like three to 5,000. We're not seeing the bigger tenants come in. A lot of owners like you'd look at are that have, you know, the thing with LIC is there's a lot of big floor plate, right? There are a lot of 15,000 square foot spaces that have it there. A lot of owners that like we've been talking to are starting to chop up their floor plates a little bit and bringing in that different audience to cater for it, differentiating their assets and the market's kind of absorbing it. Um, if you look at like Northeast Queens flushing, it remains pretty unchanged, the office market. Um, still up year over year, rents down like a percentage, 1.3%, nothing crazy. The market's kind of holding. So that's kind of holding pretty well. Central Queens, kind of the same thing. Leasing activity still on the smaller side, but you had some bigger deals on Queens Boulevard and Rago Park, like two 20,000 square foot leases. So we're starting to see the volume come up. I think we're up deal wise, I think like 30% from last quarter. So it's moving in the right direction. So there are a lot of trends coming and they're all moving the right way. Are they moving as fast as folks want? No, but quarter by quarter, we're showing positive trends. And even with the uncertainty of Delta and, and those different things, people are still marching forward. So we're seeing not that, you know, deep V, deep U, it'll be a little bit more of a valley, maybe a little bit longer, but we're kind of going in the right way. And I'm, I'm sure you like kind of, how, how have you seen the market? I mean, pretty much every broker I seem to talk to seems like, and I can kind of see this to the data on our end, we see searches going up by brokers, we see searches going up by tenants, which usually leads to a stronger pipeline six months down the way. Like, how are you seeing the market on the ground? Well, I mean, um, thank you for that. And uh, I'll give my opinion in just one second. I just wanted to ask you real quick before I lose yes. it, I'm going to forget. Uh, when you when you're saying uh, let's let's talk about uh, like, like retail and we could do mm -hmm. office right after when you're saying you're seeing the growth I mean is this are the price is the pricing and the vacancy levels you're saying it's growing from like 2020 where the pandemic hit really hard like where are we relative like before the pandemic so relative to the pandemic we're so before like North pandemic, West before. Queens yeah like we're roughly in line vacancies are roughly in line in Northwest Queens where they were in about the five-year average. So we're like, okay, like we're not dramatically off. We're right about where we should be for those like on a five-year average. It, it's down a little bit, runs up a little bit. Um, so it's not as dramatic, but they're holding. And we're kind of like on average about the five years. And LIC is a little bit different because it's kind of a changing environment. Five years there is pretty dramatic. When you look at like flushing, it's still holding really strong. Like, honestly, it's still kind of within that five-year range. We slowed down a little bit um, but like if you normalize the data and look at the numbers, it's kind of heading like towards the direction. Um, the vacancy is up a little bit, but that's just by nature of product coming on. Absorption is positive. It's just where Flushing has a lot of those mixed use projects that are coming on that are dropping square footage. The market's, you know, eating it up, but it's smart development there. They're, they're putting houses, not houses, but like apartments for the people. So they're bringing people to support the additional retail. So that's going pretty well caps are pretty strong I, it, it's not people were really scared i think about retail right like they were just like it's over nobody's gonna go to a store anymore but that's not the case what stores will look like are different now and what the type of retailers are doing are different to attract the tenants but um like south queens it's the absorption there is negative right in 2020 uh, vacancies rose a little bit but they've improved like so there's an uptick in leasing activity so south queens that area there was negative absorption but we probably took a hit of a lot of the bigger folks. It's coming back a little bit. Rent's still a little lagging, but it's moving the right way. So it kind of, you got to look at it kind of portionately, but there's no kind of story from rents are up. Leasing activity is mostly those one to 3,000 square foot folks, the local guys that are taking up the spacing or those. It's not, you know, the, but by nature, we don't have a lot of room for the 20,000, 30,000 square feet tenants for a lot of spaces either. So I'll just give my quick input here on the leasing. And uh, what I'm hearing is that, you know, warehouse for sales and leasing numbers are up. That makes sense. I think everyone knows that. Um, I can't get a lot of uh, industrial leasing assignments because there's no uh, inventory available. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and when it gets to retail, I do think retail... Um, is a segment that uh, kind of what you're saying, Kevin, like stabilized in terms of price. And um, it's it's doing well in terms of not being vacant, but 
it was like pre-COVID, you would have for a uh, main on main location, 20 offers and it's like, take it or leave it and, and whatever the best offer is. And now there's much less, but there's still enough to get at least. When it's off main and main, that's when the trouble kind of starts to happen a little bit. And I've seen certain pricing kind of dip, but in general, I think because re the nature of retail, that it's just one level on the ground, there's not that much space of it. It's, it's faring pretty well. And what I see in terms of the negotiations is that the uh, owners of property, uh, as part the well-capitalized owners that can afford to hold out, they're kind of holding and, and waiting for their price. And especially if they have a good location, um, people, they know that people value it and you have a lot of different uh, companies and options to get a good deal in the go in the location, so so prices are kind of holding firm, and when they do end up doing a deal from the ownership side, they're very cautious. They don't. I think everyone's a little traumatized from COVID on both sides, not getting rent and not being able to pay rent. And what happens is they're looking for strong, credit-worthy tenants or something where they're not going to outlay a lot of money up front and get in a position where they can kind of, uh, uh, you know, put up, put down a bunch of uh, upfront initial costs and then have the tenant leave and, and kind of be stuck with that. On the tenant side, they're also very cautious because uh, no one knows what's going to happen uh, in, in this coming year. And what happens is everyone's very picky about their locations. So they're going to the better locations as well. So there, there's a real gap and the people that are able, businesses that are able to get into these bigger spaces and, and, um, and uh, maybe bridge this gap in, in price and negotiation are the bigger tenants and the national chains. Um, so there is, um, you know, my concern is, uh, you know, how about the small businesses in Queens and, and, and where do they go to, get a deal and you know there is a uh, another section where those deals can happen uh, i just find that it's a little bit more difficult for them uh, because they're being extra cautious in their lease terms and it's just incredibly hard to 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 put those together um, and there's certain industries that are doing well uh, and this may be the new normal and that's from post covid which is like medical grocery stores uh very surprising to me are the community facility locations where pre-covid i couldn't lease community facility there's so much built and it's always a daycare or a doctor that's going to pay the premium now um with a little bit easing of the uh asks from ownership and making these structured deals where maybe they're putting less out the tenants putting less rent up front you have all these training centers and um gyms and uh, dancing centers and all these different kinds of things and little entertainment complexes opening up um, as well as the like the, the grocery delivery let's say that exploded there's like all these large well capitalized companies um, that that are expanding like crazy so uh, there's pockets of industries that are kind of flourishing now and that's how I kind of see the landscape but I wanted to get uh, Stephen's opinion, uh, your opinion on the, the retail end, the office end, and everyone knows it's kind of getting crushed office, but I think in Queens, it's like not as bad as Manhattan. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, overall, I, I don't really think we have um, kind of an office designated area where, you know, you have Midtown East in Manhattan where you know, 90% is, is office space, class A office space. And obviously we know that that's probably one of the most affected areas in, in all of New York City. Um, outside of Long Island City, uh, maybe a couple pockets in Rego Park and Forest Hills. I mean, there's really not much class A office space there. So if you're looking for class A office, there's, there's a handful of buildings that you can choose from. And we actually went through that experience where we were looking for, uh, you know, 5,000 square foot space plus or minus for our WIPCO investment sales flagship office in Queens. And it was it was tough to find. Uh, we ended up at 8002 Two Gardens Road. 
um, on uh, on Queens Boulevard, but it was it was tough to find options in these Class A buildings, and uh, it seemed like you know most of the space in those Class A buildings was was already spoken for, um, and there wasn't large chunks of, of vacancy in those buildings. Um, the balance is more generational, uh, more mom and pop. You know, a lot of um, you know office spaces that. Um, are there by necessity, you know, over, a, a, you know, retail, you know, a two over one where you have office space on, on the second floor or third floor, um, and, you know, the dentist or, you know, something more inclined for the local communities. So overall, you know, if it's a large chunky office space, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, less interest as far as um, buyer interest goes. And we're seeing a more conservative approach, um, you know, especially in, in, in more motivated areas. Um, but, you know, office as a whole, you know, it's, it's hit or miss. You know, hopefully there's some other asset class within there or long-term long credit that would balance out value. On the retail end, uh, again, most of it is neighborhood uh, driven, um, you know, one story taxpayers. And we really haven't seen too much of a swing there. Um, as far as, you know, vacancy and interest, you know, if something comes up on 108th Street that has four or five stores there, um, you know, we're getting a very competitive uh, number uh, and cap rate of, as what we used to get, you know, two or three years ago. So not much change there. The big box, you know, there's not a lot of that product, you know, embedded into, into Queens. So we're seeing a couple of transformations there. You know, we still the JC Penny. Uh, sold over in Elmhurst and a couple of the big box there, but they'll find new life for those. You know, it's it's a different type of tenancy. It's a different type of approach. Uh, you might see some of those, um, you know, brands like I just mentioned go out, but you know, there's there's five more behind them that are looking for you know larger space in Queens, and there's really not much to choose from. So that's going to find a new home. It's going to be a new experience, a new type of retail, um, and I think that we're just going through a resetting. Of what that retail landscape looks like, and also a resetting on pricing. Where, uh, you know, we we uh, just for an example, we, we always saw, and I, you could probably talk to this, you know, better than I, uh, Michael. But you know, we saw 150 to 250 dollar foot rents in, in Flushing. You know, those are resetting now. Um, you know, they're not going for 50 or 75, but the 200 dollar rent is now finding a home at 125 to 150. Um, so you have to go through these resets, you know, retail is not uh, as in vogue as it was, but they're permutating uh, both on the concept itself and on the pricing. Um, and because we have very little of that type of product throughout, um, both on the neighborhood end and on the, on the, uh, on the larger side, on, on what's called the institutional scale, um, those will get refilled. It's just going to be a longer turnaround time before we can say, this is what retail looks like now in Queens. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. I think it both is resetting on both of those fronts. And, um, you know, I think there's reasons why it seems like it's slow to reset, but there were a lot of uh, tenants that were in the middle of going out. There were a lot of dark stores from the larger chains and banks and things like that that were still paying rent so ownership could hold out longer. But I think the my overall consensus is that prices are resetting downward and um, people are still uh, holding out to kind of see what the market's going to become. But you already you already see in certain transactions and spaces that need to transact the reset taking place for sure. Um, so like we could talk about this forever and uh i don't know I, I could talk to like deep into the numbers with you guys for probably like three days straight <laughs> so i don't know how the uh membership how general or specific they want us to go but what i do want to do because it's 245 is ask you steven and kevin i just want to give the floor to you and you know there may be i think something that you think is important to update the uh the the viewers and everyone about queen's real estate going forward Sure. Um, I, th I think overall, we're in a good spot, relatively speaking, to the grander and overarching New York City you know, real estate marketplace. Um, it may seem like a, a slow 
uh, move, you know, from the early stages of the pandemic, but it's 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 really not. You know, things are moving, uh, you know, quickly. Uh, they're changing quickly. Um, from where we are now to where we were two years ago is 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 light years. Um, so I, I think we all should have a conservative approach going forward about how our communities will look. Um, some will uh, migrate a little bit faster. Some of these asset classes will will change and, and appreciate quicker. Uh, but overall, you know, we're queen strong. Um, I, I still think that our demographic, the way that we're laid out, uh, the generational ownership, um, the, the large middle class, um, the, the workforce, you know, uh, you know a component uh, of, of Queens, um, I, I think we're, we're, we're ideally situated for whatever uh, New York City is going to look like over the next, you know, five to 10 years. Um, so I would say, you know, be patient um, and, you know, things are changing. We're seeing them on a daily basis. There's still capital circulating, you know, no matter how much you hear about people moving out of state or, or moving capital somewhere else, you know, that is happening. Uh, but I, you know, in some circumstances, it, you know, I feel it's overstated. Um, so I think we're in a good shape and, you know, we're queen strong and, you know, continue to support the, the local uh, businesses, uh, you know, that's, that's very important. Be vigilant. Um, and I, I think we're going to be in good shape um, as we go forward. Yeah, I agree. I think the important message is recovery is under the way, on, like underway. Like we are moving in that direction. We are maybe not running as fast as we want in every asset class, but we're trending in the right direction. A lot of the numbers that were scary and people were worried about, we're kind of on the other side now and we're seeing things move. Like, going to kind of Stephen's point, like Queens is unique and it, it is faring better than other boroughs, just whether you look at multifamily, certainly like the office and different markets because of the strong population, the strong community that, that it is here and the diverse community that we represent. So it's important to remember things are moving in the right direction. Um, we are seeing positive, you know, things going through. We are moving in the right direction, even though it doesn't always feel like it. it's there little by little incrementally. Anecdotally, the numbers bear that all out. So I think we will see things move in the right direction. A lot of the things where we worried about retailers, a lot of that going back to it, those are folks that maybe were on the way out anyway. And now we just pushed ahead the next generation of retail, maybe five years. And we're seeing what that looks like. It's a strong community. It's a community with you know income that people want to be a part of. So I think the borough will benefit that. And, you know, it's just important to keep that in mind that we are in a good position, even compared to some of our sister boroughs. So good things ahead, like you said, conservative approach, but so far so good. So we got 12 minutes. I don't see any questions. So we got a little bit more time to talk about some stuff. Uh, if anyone has questions, just uh, drop them in and, and we'll get we'll get to them uh, right away. So I just want to, you know, off the top of my head, I'm thinking, all right. So what 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 a lot of people are going to want to know is like what opportunities may be coming in the future and, and, and what kind of deals. So on the leasing end, you know, what I see is is something like in it, something like um, tenants can work with landlords now in a different way where because there's more vacant space and maybe not on main on main because main and main demand is pretty good in, in the uh the terms and the pricing is 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 relatively um, rel holding holding on to those the, the previous pricing, but main on main is just a small populated subset of all the properties, and even like a block away from main and main, th there's a lot of different retail and particularly office in these opportunities. And I see I see something where a tenant can possibly move into a space, maybe on a cheaper price. Um, but but more so on the terms where the owner may want to occupy the space and the concern is they don't you know the owner doesn't want a, a tenant moving in um them the owner spending a lot of money and then moving out and that's kind of the same concern on the tenant side where they move in spend a bunch of money but they don't know what the market is and there's like these happy mediums where maybe the space is existing in a certain way where the uh, initial work isn't that much and the landlords these days are giving more um it's more acceptable to give like the first two years of rent cheaper or spread out a bunch of free rent over the years. Um, there may be like sec more security deposit down where it be to, to satisfy the owner in terms of not being so much at risk. 
but you can burn it down over the years. So the contract negotiations are, are getting more fluid and there's, they're complicated, but there's ways to make it work for everybody. And uh, what, what I see these days is the, everyone's very nitpicky about the lease clauses. And when it's adversarial, the deal kind of falls apart. But when, if you stick with it and, and both parties go in with a good attitude and, and, and identify where, where, where it makes sense, then, um, you know, I think there's, there's a way to, to get into a space for, for a good deal on, on both ends. That's what I said to see on like the leasing end, but moving forward on like opportunity into the marketplace, like, you know, what do you see in sales, uh, Stephen, like, Yeah, I guess they just need a good broker like you to to mitigate those those lease negotiations. <laughs> uh, I've been there. Doing there are a lot of opportunities out there. I think most people have to look at it on a longer term approach. You know, we got we got settled into looking at a three or five or seven year horizon to be able to you know turn a profit and, and exit a property or, or add value. Um, and it's just really not the marketplace for, for the most part uh, that you can look at, you know, buying a piece of investment property, looking at an investment property, or underwriting it. You have to look at, a, in today's world, there's a lot of opportunity, but you have to look at it on a longer term approach. Um, you know, if you're looking at a 10 or 20 year horizon, if you have that type of capital, if you have that type of time, uh, if you are committed to New York, um, there's a lot of opportunity if you have a longer term horizon. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we've seen the, the return of the generational buyer is what, is what I like to call it, where uh, we had so many speculators in the market. And, and that was a market that you can you know, flip properties, get in and out in a year or two or three uh, and make really good returns. Uh, but that's really not the way that most people have made their wealth in commercial real estate and in Queens in general, because I, I think there's more generational owners and buyers in Queens than anywhere else in New York City. So um, I think you have to expand your horizon uh, and, and mostly your time horizon. And there's, there's a lot of good opportunity out there to, to be able to uh, make the investments into Queens. Um, but, the but at this point in time and for the foreseeable future, you really have to expand your time horizon um, to be able to, um, you know, really dig in, find those good opportunities and, and really uh, create a good yield for yourself and, you know, for your family. So uh, I think just looking forward on a longer period, um, there's plenty of opportunity right now um, that you can find uh, in the borough. Someone told me about it the other day, a 0% Costco for sale. Uh, so, you know, there's something like that, you know, like these triple net properties that like this ultra, like a 2% cap rate, but, um, you know, you got a good spot with a good tenant. Like, does, do these things make sense? I mean, that's probably a zero cash flow asset where there's some some taxable uh, benefit that you get. But um, overall, yeah, I mean, those do exist. You know, the the, the triple net properties right now, um, they're very compressed as far as price goes. A lot of people are now looking to get out of multifamily because of the rent regulations and go into these, uh, you know, no management, credit, tenancy. There's so much money trying to find that that it's hard to make a return that makes sense, especially in the tri-state area. Um, we're seeing a lot more people, you know, look to JVs and creative ways to, um, you know, monetize their assets instead of selling it and trying to compete with institutional money uh, for a CVS in South Florida, um, you know, at a 4% cap rate, you know, and if they have taxable issues or, or liabilities, you know, people are, are getting a little bit more creative, which we help them with, where, you know, people might do a, a 49 year or a 99 year ground lease uh, to create um, you know, generational wealth and, and good income without having uh, all the headache and cost of selling into something and buying something else or, or doing a joint venture where they have a piece of land. Instead of buy, uh, selling that piece of land and trying to find, you know, assets somewhere else throughout the country, if they're looking to stay here, um, you know, team up with a builder. Uh, and there's a lot of taxable advantages there where the builder comes in and, and builds a site for them and they maintain equity in it by contributing the land. So there's a lot of different ways that you could skin the cat 
uh, to create wealth for your family and to monetize your asset outside of just selling it and trying to find, like, as you said, a, a 2% Costco somewhere. Um, so those are, those are different options to keep in mind when looking at your own uh, portfolio. Got it. So it sounds like, um, I don't know, I don't know if this is the right word, like the traditional put in the due diligence, make the product, improve the product and hold it, manage it correctly. And in a long-term sense, it'll do very well. Yeah, there's, there's different options. So instead yeah. of just throwing it out there and thinking that there's something better on, on the other side, you know, really dive into it uh, and see if there's any way that you can work with the asset you have. Got it. Um, there actually are some questions here. I didn't realize it's a different chat box. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, if, uh, are you, Seth Morton says, are you looking at residential flight from New York City or growth in commercial sp space based on market growth? Not quite sure what that means. Um, but I think... Uh, I mean, that, that's a good question, I think, for Kevin in terms of, uh, and I don't even know if this makes sense, but is the market growing? Like, is the overall value of the Queen's market back to the value it was in 2019? In terms of, like, I guess we're asking, like, popul like how big was the flight out of the boroughs? Is, like, in that, is that... Uh, I don't well, know. I, I don't know about the flight, but just in terms of like asset value, is everything up? Is inflation yeah. making everything up? Or like, I mean, like kind of going to Stephen's point, like they're like if you believe in the boroughs and you believe like in the fact that the interest rates are going up and there's different things occurring, like it's a good time. Like if you believe in the boroughs, it's a good time to invest. Like with the reset going on, prices came down. If you believe in Queens, which I think everybody does, that's here it's a good time to get in at a better price than you could have gotten two years ago. Like we took a hit, but we're also coming back. So there's opportunity here in terms where you might not have been able to come back into this market or just you were priced out and it was more institutional. There, there's opportunity to be had. Um, so I think it, it is a good time to, to, to get in at a better rate because things are moving right. The scary numbers are kind of gone and we're kind of seeing where we're going. So I think, you know, it is, there's opportunity here. There is value, you know, like when you look at office, like vacancy rates are up. Yeah, short term, they might take a hit on like office value, but we're looking at what happened in two years when we should probably, like Stephen said, be looking at 10, 20. Like, I, I don't think we're ever going to be in a world again where people are going to stay far apart or other forever. There's value to being together and, and, the biggest companies that can actually the, the most virtual are already getting in cheaper. That's why you see a lot of these big tech companies getting down on real estate in New York city where they might not ever dreamed of, you know, getting it now Would those folks believe in it. A lot of the, the financial institutional companies believe in the value. Those folks have probably more data than literally everybody in the world it's looking five or 10 years. If they're doing it, I think it's safe for everybody to kind of take a deep breath and believe in it too. So I think short term. Yeah. But you might be getting a better deal. So, you know, yeah, values may be down a little bit here or there, but it's a, maybe a good time to buy, like, same as the stock market. Yeah, I mean, I definitely believe in New York City and definitely Queens and especially the main on main stuff. So I just, I guess, uh, lump me in with everyone else and I'll get a 2% cap rate, I guess. <laughs> I don't see a way around it, but um, it makes sense. I mean, I would love to talk about more stuff. I want to talk about inflation and more finance stuff and everything, um, but we don't have time for that. So um thanks everyone and if you guys got any closing remarks just let me know or we'll just shut it down i think we're good go queens all right thanks everyone i hope everyone enjoyed um jeff gross is our queen's chamber uh member uh staff member who's handling all this so jeff i'm just gonna leave and then leave it to you thanks everyone thanks, thanks, gentlemen. Gentlemen. Appreciate it. thanks kevin thanks jeff yes.